Hey everyone, this is Rick, and welcome back to the Seed Startup Journey, the entrepreneurship podcast sharing the origin stories of amazing founders and the companies in 20 minutes. Today, we'll be chatting with Jamie Lin, a serial entrepreneur, investor, and a father. Jamie is the founder of AppWorks, an accelerator, venture capital, and a school built by founders for founders. AppWorks has currently helped over 400 startups valued at over $17.4 billion in total. Oh, and did I mention that Jamie is also the president of Taiwan Mobile? Join me in discovering how Jamie first got started, the challenges he faced while building AppWorks, as well as what he thinks you should be doing to 100x how much you learn every day. Hey Jamie, thank you so much for coming onto our podcast today. You are the founder and chairman of AppWorks as well as the CEO of Taiwan Mobile. And these are very impressive titles, but I want to first take us back to the beginning of your startup journey. I believe you started programming at the age of 10 and in middle and high school, you'd often fall asleep in class because it was too boring. So have you always known growing up that you'd one day be an entrepreneur and perhaps take a somewhat different path than many of your peers? I didn't know. Growing up, I was more of a, a rebel, so I was a little bit anti-business. But I, th- I think the turning point uh, probably happened around 94, 95, when I was uh, in my last year in my high school. So uh, back then, internet started to happen. And I, uh, so I, I, really, I was really into uh, programming and computers. And I was uh, I had my uh, first modem back in the late 80s. So I was already dialing to the net even before there was a triple W and browser. So by late high school, early college, I realized people can make a career out of building internet companies. The, that was sort of the turning point for me. So from there, I started realizing maybe I'm interested in building things on the internet. That's awesome. And to paint a better picture for the listeners, uh, after that, you started a few companies in college and you went on to get your MBA at NYU Stern. In 2009, I believe you were getting your green card. You were selling low into New York, but you decided to come back to Taiwan. And I know that the food here is amazing, but (laughs) from your standpoint, you know, you were deep into startups and tech. iPhone was on the rise. Silicon Valley was booming. It made sense to stay in the States. So what made you decide to come back to Taiwan? A few things, right? So number one, iPhone and Android. These two devices are essentially uh, pocket-sized connected computers that is going to uh, make people, uh, uh, keep people online 24-7, right? And it's going to make the internet companies even more powerful. And it's going to make the hardware even more commoditized. I realized that Taiwan had to start growing its software uh, presence. Uh, and then on top of that, it was also sort of the, the, the fact that uh, Barack Obama got elected. People weren't uh, thinking that he was going to be able to uh, win, but he really was able to communicate directly to uh, vote to the voters through social media and fundraise through crowdfunding. So that also marked the sort of the, the coming of the Internet. So, so both of the things happened in 2008. And then another thing would be the financial crisis, right? So uh, uh, during the financial crisis, I realized that the U.S. system has some fundamental flaws and I was probably not going to be able to uh, uh, do anything about it. But I had a son, so I was really thinking, do I want my son to grow up a, 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 a Taiwanese-American or do I want my son to grow up a Taiwanese? So in the end, all of these factors um, together uh, sort of uh, pushed me to uh, decide that I wanted to move back to Taiwan, help a uh, younger generation start a new generation of software companies that would help provide uh, more growth for Taiwan for the next decade or two. And then hopefully my son will grow up a happy uh, Taiwanese. Yeah. That's amazing. So in order to do that, you started AppWorks. And today, AppWorks has supported over 400 startups valued at over $17 billion in total. Some people call AppWorks the Y Combinator of Taiwan. (laughs) Could you tell us a little bit more about what AppWorks is? So AppWorks is essentially a school for founders, right? So uh, these days, if you want to become a lawyer, you go to a law school. If you want to become a doctor, you go to the, a medical school. But if you want to become a founder, there's no school for you to go to. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, there's business schools, but uh, most of the things they teach there are uh, for managing bigger companies. Mm-hmm. But not, every, not a lot of people are teaching 
how to uh, go from zero to one to build something out of nothing. Startup accelerators essentially is a, a, a sort of a supplement to the current school system. It, it's a professional organization that helps founders become better founders. When you uh, want to help people become better founders, it's not about teaching them exactly how to do things as a founder. It's more like providing an environment that encourages them to try different things and also learn from each other. Because you, when you're trying to build something from nothing, there is no existing formula you can copy paste. So you're, uh, a lot of it is through trial and error and through sort of taking inspirations from what others have done. We are uh, equity free, uh, fee free accelerator. So founders don't uh, need to pay us anything to join our program. Uh, on top of that, we have a lot of different services that we provide to the founders uh, for free. For example, uh, all the all the different classes, all the different credits from different uh, cloud providers. You can also tap into our uh, master team uh, for uh, recruiting help, media exposure help, legal matters or uh, uh, finance and co- accounting help. We have around 100 mentors that we work with. So through the program, you can uh, get connected with a few of them and hopefully one or two becomes your uh, lifelong uh, so you build a lifelong mentorship relationship with one or two of them all we do is help uh, help founders uh, be better uh, versions of themselves so it's a very sophisticated program and i was just wondering like did you come up with all that back in 2009 like was that in your head (laughs) No, actually, uh, so so um, so 2009, early 2009, I left my uh, previous startup in New York, and I was thinking what I wanted to do next. So I was looking into all the different options, and I, uh, for the longest time, I've heard of Y Combinator, but I've mm-hmm. never really looked into what they did. Uh, and then I started uh, uh, studying this four-year-old organization that was uh, trying to professionally help founders get better. And then I realized, oh, that's the thing I wanted to do. Um, so I was, uh, I started my blog back in the uh, uh, middle of 2009. And in early 2010, I uh, launched this uh, application on my blog. And it's essentially an MVP. I realized that uh, Y Combinator started with uh, three or five startups. So if I can get a, a few startups to join my program, I would move back to Taiwan to start AppWords. Before I knew it, 33 startups applied and I flew back to Taiwan to have interviews with them and then realized that 11 of them were actually really good. So I told them, hey, you guys are all admitted. And without knowing exactly what uh, I needed to do through the program. So um, after I went back to the U.S., I uh, flew to California, uh, flew to essentially Bay Area and then started interviewing people who have gone through YC and uh, uh, figure out what worked, what didn't. But essentially, when Apple started, d- uh, during the week, we only have uh, two, three things that we did. So uh, we didn't have a lot of all, the, all these other uh, bells and whistles and uh, all, the, all of the other things that we're providing to founders were built along the way. So once we started to have founders, essentially our customers, and then they started telling us, hey, Jamie, we need this, we need that. Then we uh, started building these uh, different types of uh, services for them. To dive a little bit deeper into this journey, because you know, right now when people hear your name, they think of you as the leading startup figure, the youngest telecom CEO. But I know that you know startups are hard. And I was chatting with the co-founder of T-Mobile recently, and he told me that they actually went bankrupt once and they had to basically beg their vendors for money. So I was wondering if you could also share with us some of, you know, perhaps your darkest moments or some of your challenges along the way. <laughs> Throughout the 10, 11 years of AppWorks, I think the hardest part was to uh, raise fun. Uh, the, the hardest problem for VCs is deal sourcing. Even though there are a lot of founders starting startups, but it's very hard for VCs to get to know them effectively. So uh, I realized that uh, starting an accelerator, offering it for free, if it attracts high quality founders, then I almost would solve the deal flow problem as a VC. So mm-hmm. on top of that, uh, if I can tack on a VC fund, then uh, that would be the monetization for my accelerator. What we didn't realize was how, how hard it was <laughs> to mm-hmm. raise VC funds. Uh, everywhere we we went, they would ask, okay, so what's your track record? 
what kind of uh, startups have you invested in? What's, what kind of financial performance do you have? And of course, we had nothing. So we had nothing to prove that we're good VCs. Almost all investors we were talking to were telling us no. So then we uh, decided, okay, then if the financial type of investors wasn't gonna uh, trust us until we have enough track record, maybe we should go the strategic route. We're producing all of these app companies and the smartphone companies and uh, telco companies were all starting their own app stores. So we realized that there's a synergy there. And so luckily in the end, uh, we were able to convince HTC. Back then they were still a top three smartphone, smartphone maker in the world. Uh, so, so the CFO was pretty happy about our fund and they, he decided that he wanted to put in a little bit less than a million to anchor our fund. And uh, once we tell everybody uh, HTC was anchoring the fund, then some of the telcos decided to join. But uh, when the internal proposal went from uh, the CFO to the CEO and the chairwoman, the proposal got shut down. Shut down. So, <laughs> so in the end, uh, we were back to square one, right. and uh, with with no anchor investor, no VCs wanted to invest in our company. I, I'm telling the story just to uh, show how hard it is to raise a fund, uh, even after you've already built a successful accelerator that was attracting uh, high quality founders. Mm -hmm. So throughout all these challenges what keeps you going because I, I found in one of your interviews you said in chinese will it be tra translated to when i wake up every morning it's not the clock that wakes me up it's my dream so what is that dream uh well in the end it's uh my son right so i he is a u.s citizen right he was born in the u.s i should have forced him to move back to taiwan so now the burden is on me, right? So if I don't really put up my best effort in turning Taiwan's sort of a, a, a marginalizing economy around, then he's not gonna grow up a proud Taiwanese and maybe he's gonna be mad at me. So every, every day I feel that I have to be responsible to this decision I make. And uh, the clock is ticking. My son is growing up every day and uh, I have to make it work before uh, it's too late. Have you asked him recently if he's proud of being a Taiwanese? Uh, it's still early for him, so he's only 13. When he was growing up, he was always insist that he's American and American. <laughs> but now he would be say he would say that he's a Taiwanese that also has uh, sort of U.S. citizenship. So so we'll see. We'll see by the age of uh, 18 or 20, what's what he's gonna say about uh, his sort of uh, uh, which country or which culture is ident and identifying. So basically seven more years of hard work. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> the clock is That's ticking. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. So after, you know, seeing hundreds of startups and thousands of founders, have you identified any common qualities or skills among the really successful entrepreneurs? Yeah, so, so we call these uh, qualities uh, the three H's, uh, namely the heart, the head and the hand, right? These are all uh, very important. So, so if you if you observe the really successful founders, you'll realize that they they have a huge heart. Well, they have really good strategic thinking, and also a head that uh, would allow them to learn really fast. And then uh, on top of that, they have a very good execution, and they're really good at recruiting uh, good people around them to help them with executions. Uh, but if you observe younger founders. Uh, everyone's got to start with somewhere, right? So start somewhere, right? So when you're just starting, you probably only know very little about sort of the things you need to know as a founder and also the industries that you're you're disrupting, right? And and your execution is probably not going to be uh, superb. But over time, what sets a, a good founder apart from his peers, it would be it's his delta. So uh, say that everybody starts with average three H's, but the really good founders would prove to improve sort of the fastest uh, amongst his peers. So th that's sort of the, the, the model that we're looking at uh, when we're observing founders. So uh, we observe their uh, heart, head, and hand, and how mm -hmm. fast they're growing uh, these three ages. Got it. And kind of on a fun note, if you didn't start AppWorks back in 2009, mm -hmm. what do you think you would be doing? Like, did you have some other idea you were interested? It's probably uh, really unlikely that I didn't start AppWords because the financial crisis, the fact that Barack Obama was elected a president and the fact that iPhone and Android came out, these are all 
huge, huge um, events. I, I needed to pivot my, my life because of these events. But if uh, these things never happened, then maybe I, I would have stayed in the U.S. I would, would have probably still uh, work in startups for a while. But I've, I've always known that I, I, I wanted to one day uh, became, become a venture investor because uh, when, when we were starting our first company, we had this angel uh, investor uh, whose name is Bob Xie. Xie. So w- when we were uh, only 21, 22, we were trying to start our company, all of the questions we had re- regarding to building a company, whenever we had, then we would pick up the phone and call Bob. And Bob, Bob would say, oh, sure, I'll, 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 sw- I'll swing by and help you guys with that problem. We were always uh, very appreciative of all the sort of help helps that he gave us. And I always told myself, oh, one day if I become a successful founder, I, I want to be like Bob. I want to turn around and become an investor and start helping younger founders. So I, I always knew that uh, at some point I wanted to become a venture investor. Got it. And kind of on a similar note, if you could go back in time and say something you know, to the 20-year-old Jamie, what would you say to him? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, think, I think looking back, all the things that happened were um, meant to happen and all the things that happened uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, made me the person I am today. So I wouldn't change anything. So I also spoke with Nice, uh, an AppWorks partner, trying to find any hobbies you do for fun or to relax. (laughs) And he told me that, to be honest, your life is kind of boring. (laughs) But I know that, you know, being an entrepreneur and investor and also leading one of the largest tech companies is a stressful job. So can you share with us, you know, what you do to keep yourself mentally sane and recharge? My life is a lot of fun. I'm doing the things that I like the most. (laughs) So, so I think, I think a lot of people, when they go home, they have to spend hours watching TV uh, and and get away from their main life. I think, I don't think it's it's the hobby that is worth discussing. Maybe they should discuss uh, how to get a job they like the, the they like more. Right? <laughs> the way I uh, let out my stress would be exercising. Right, so I run mm-hmm. uh, around six kilometer so to every uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So uh, during the process, I get to so uh, clear my mind. Essentially, I don't know if you know this thing called the incubation effect in your on, in your brain you have you actually have this uh, subconscious right and your subconscious is maybe 10 or even 100 times more powerful than your main conscious and your subconscious is always collecting data and uh, processing all the data and uh, uh, trying to figure out the problems you have you would all, all of a sudden have a eureka moment during uh, your your shower during your bath or whenever you're relaxed. And it's not because in this, during those moments, you're more creative. It's because during those moments, your uh, subconscious would upload the good ideas mm-hmm. it has arrived to after a long period of collecting information and calculating. So I think running serves also uh, that purpose. So when, uh, when you run at a point, at some point you'll get into a Zen zone. And once you're at that zone, uh, you have a better idea on how to resolve some of the hardest problems that is that's happening uh, in your uh, uh, startups or in your businesses. And I, I stick to my running routine and I'm benefiting a lot from it, both uh, physically and mentally. In an interview back in 2011, you were asked the question, what is one thing you would recommend everyone to do? And back then you said to start a blog. If you were to make another such recommendation now, what would it be? Like, would it be to buy some NFTs? <laughs> no, I'm still, still writing a blog. So I think, I think um, writing articles is probably the best way to learn things and to get to know yourself. Mm-hmm. When you're writing about some of these things, uh, if you realize that you don't understand enough about it, it forces you to... Uh, research online and find more about it, right? When you're reading it, you, you, if you, you, you learn uh, 1x from reading it, when you're writing it, it would actually deepen the learning by 10 or even 100x. And then on top of that, uh, you would build a presence and build a following. I've written um, almost 1,400 articles since 2009. And I think I wouldn't have known even uh, sort of a 5% of what I know 
if I wouldn't have uh, written so many articles, blogging or uh, publishing regularly, I think that's a, the best thing you can do for yourself. Got it. Yeah, I think I can relate to some of the benefits from my podcast, but maybe I should start turning that into articles too. That's you awesome. should. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. So to wrap things up, I prepared a quick game. It's called This or That. Basically, I'll give you two options and then you can pick whichever one you like more. First one, teleportation or flight? Flight, because teleportation equals uh, death. San Francisco or Taipei? Uh, Taipei. Ethereum or Flow? Flow. <laughs> I have to pick Flow. I think both. Both are, both are going to be great. <laughs> Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk? Oh, that's a hard one. Both are... Um, if, if I have to pick, uh, no, I cannot. Both, both, are my, <laughs> both are my heroes. So the final one, a startup with really great founders, but a bad product versus a startup with a really great product, but bad founders. Good founder any day. Yeah, a good founder would pivot a startup uh, to better and better products. But a bad founder would pivot a startup to a, a worse and worse product. Awesome. So that's it for today's episode. Thank you so much for coming on today. And I wish you the best of luck and stay safe as well. Thank you, Rick. It's been fun. I hope you enjoyed this episode. The one thing that stuck with me after chatting with Jamie was actually his dedication and discipline. Not only has Jamie written over 1400 articles in the past decade, he has also been running six kilometers three days a week. On top of that, he's also managing AppWorks and Taiwan Mobile. So the next time you're putting off something because you're too busy, think about Jamie. <laughs> Let me know in the comments below what your favorite part or your takeaways are. And before you go, if you like our weekly episodes summarized in one minute startup droplets delivered straight to your inbox, make sure to head over to our website and subscribe. I'll also put the link in the descriptions below. That's it for today's episode. Let's grow our seed of innovation and creativity together, and I'll see you next time.